Let us now pray for peace. God of compassion, have mercy this day on the people of the Ukraine and all who are displaced by conflict. Restore to them the gift of peace. Grant wisdom to the governments of the world. Bring good in the midst of evil and suffering. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, who gave his life to bring peace to the world. Amen. Amen. We'll now have our worship. <coughs> Please feel free to stand or, or sit uh, as you uh, 
So we have a number of songs, and we'll just uh, let you sit on so that you feel the journey. <laughs> Beauty 
me in your presence to sit at your feet when your love surrounds me and makes me complete. This is my desire. Holy, holy, holy. 
me as pillars of your throne. Let our praise to you be as incense as we come before you and worship you alone. As we see you in your splendor, as we came. We confess to you our lack of care for the world you have given us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We confess to you our selfishness in not sharing the earth's bounty fairly. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We confess to you our failure to protect resources for others. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring us his pardon and peace, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Before our readings, we're going to sing this hymn, asking that the words we hear will really speak to us as we receive the food of God's holy word. So again, stand if you like.
taken from Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 to 14, the valley of dry bones. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me to and fro among them. I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to those bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on me, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone, we are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, O my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. So now the Gospel reading, which is on page 7, 
5, 8, it's from chapter 11. We have a cast of readers to do this in dramatised form. The words are exactly the same as in the book of Project Dramatis. This is not. That's better. So if we have our readers. Found on page 758. It's John chapter 11, 1 to 45, the death of Lazarus. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose, bro whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus. Lord, the one you love, is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, the disciples said, a short while ago the Jews were trying, trying to stone you, and yet you're going back. Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus has been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Your brother will rise again. I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher's here and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But 
some of them said, Could not he, who opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a pig with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone. Oh, but Lord, by this time there's going to be a bad odour because he's been in there for four days. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and who had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. So today is the fourth Sunday of the month, and uh, according to the template that Jill drew out, we have very little liturgy, and that leaves room for lots of what the service is about, word and worship. Um, so I asked Richard to lead a, an extended time of worship at the beginning, and give us, we'll have more time to think about the, the word. I was preaching on the last fourth Sunday, that was the first Sunday in Lent, and I was talking about money, if you remember. We gave out little envelopes for Lent's donations. So in a way, that was about almsgiving, one of the strands of Lent. Today is another strand of Lent, death and resurrection, as, uh, as we saw in the readings. Now that reading from John's Gospel is quite a long one, so I thought that having it in the dramatised version would really help us to identify with the thoughts and feelings of all those involved. Well, maybe not the narrator, but the others, you know what I mean. So let's just reflect a few minutes on those who were involved. We first heard the voice of Mary in the Bible reading, but she seems to have spoken for them both. As it says, it was the sisters who sent word to Jesus. A messenger therefore traveled the 20 miles or so to where Jesus was. He was on the other side of the river Jordan with his disciples. From what follows, we can assume that by sending the message that their brother was sick, the sisters thought that Jesus would at once set out for Bethany. And then there's this puzzling verse. Jesus loved Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. What? Loved him so much, he let him die? Well, reading on, it appears that Jesus had deliber deliberately delayed going to Bethany so that everyone could be sure that Lazarus really was dead. The Jews believe that after death, the soul hovered around the body for four days. So Jesus waited two days before setting out on the two-day journey to Bethany. Jesus' intention was to show his power over death rather than his power to heal. Meanwhile, the two sisters presumably waited at home, expecting help to arrive at any moment. We're told that this Mary was the one who poured expensive perfume on Jesus. That was to the disgust of the onlookers who thought it a waste of money. That's related in the next chapter of John's Gospel, as well as in Matthew and Mark's Gospels. Jesus saw that pouring of perfume as an act preparing his body for burial. Judas Iscariot, on the other hand, who was treasurer for the group, was so upset at this waste of money that he decided to betray Jesus, thus setting in train the events of Easter. We also read in Luke's Gospel that when Jesus visited the family, Mary was sitting at his feet, listening, whilst Martha, her older sister, was rushing around preparing the meal. Martha complained to Jesus about the lack of help by Mary. Mary was again commended by Jesus by her actions 
She seemed to understand and accept that Jesus was to die. Now, when Jesus did reach Bethany, Mary, who had been at home mourning, rushed to join Martha. Mary fell at Jesus' feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Something that I'm sure everyone else was thinking. The sisters surely felt that Jesus, their friend, had let them down. So Jesus not only intentionally delayed his arrival until everyone was sure that Lazarus was dead, but it seems that Jesus could simply have healed his friend, Lazarus, without even going to Bethany. There's an account in Mark and Matthew's Gospel where Jesus heals a centurion servant without even going to him. But the sisters quite reasonably assumed that Jesus would come to them without any delay. Their home in Bethany was the nearest thing that Jesus had to a base. It was clearly somewhere he felt he, he felt comfortable. He was welcomed. They were his friends. And there's a but now. Bethany was only two miles from Jerusalem, where Jesus had a run-in with the authorities. So the disciples had been at first super surprised that Jesus should even consider going to Bethany. If you read through the previous two chapters of John's Gospel, you'll see why. And then the disciples misunderstood what Jesus meant when he said that Lazarus was asleep. After Jesus spelt out that Lazarus was actually dead, Thomas said, let's go with Jesus, despite his fears for their safety. When Jesus neared Bethany, he went out to meet him, but Martha, Martha, the older sister, the one who rushed around doing all the work when Jesus visited. She was the first to reach Jesus. She said, what I'm not sure everyone else thought. Mary too later voiced, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. So this Martha was outspoken, she was impetuous. She was tired of waiting for Jesus to act in the way she believed he could and upset that he was too late. So she went out and told him what was on her mind. Mary, on the other hand, true to character, had stayed at home quietly mourning before joining them and making the same point. So the sisters said the same thing, but Martha may be in anger and Mary more in sorrow. We all have different ways of dealing with grief, and that's one of the things I'll leave you to discuss in your life groups. There are prompts in the sermon notes to take away. And there must have been quite a scene when they reached the village. Friends and relations were there to join the mourning. This was no gentle weeping, but there was wailing, there was shrieking. This coupled with the distress of his friends, and perhaps knowing that he too was to die, Jesus was deeply moved and troubled. Then that shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Borrowing lines from a hymn, hands that flung stars into space, now wiped away tears of human grief. The reading ends, therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and who had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. Seeing that Jesus had the power to raise someone from the dead would also, no doubt like Martha, they would believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And we too, with this first-hand account, can believe and trust that Jesus is who he said he was. So Lazarus had been dead, or at least in the tomb, for four days. We can only imagine what it was like to be Lazarus. He didn't have a speaking role in the dramatised reading. We're going to hear from him now in a manner of speaking. Stuart's going to read um, what the author, Nick Fawcett, imagined were Lazarus's thoughts. Says so Stuart. It was so weird, so unreal, at least that's how it felt, and yet it happened. I breathed my last, no question about that. After those long days of sickness, the pain growing, the strength failing. After those final terrible hours, sweat pouring down my face, lungs gasping for air, at last came 
peace, darkness closing about me, and suddenly welcome, though it had long been feared. An end to the struggle, the battle nearly over. For a moment, I was a child again, comforted by my mother's embrace, a youth running wild as the wind, a man setting out afresh on life's great adventure, a father taking my child into my arms, and then rest. The light went out, the flame extinguished, the game completed. Only it wasn't. For suddenly, a voice summoned me back to the fray. Sunshine burst into the tomb, and consciousness returned. No wonder they gasped. No wonder they swooned. No wonder they wept for joy. For I had been taken from them. I had been dead, was alive. And yes, I thanked him. Of course I did, after the confusion had cleared anyway. But it took a while, I can tell you. And even now, just once in a while, I wonder if he really did me any favours. For I know that one day, I must face it all again. Yet, It'll be different then, very different. Not just because I've been there before and know that there is nothing to fear, but because Jesus has shown me that death is not so much the end as the beginning. That's why he raised me from the tomb, not just to restore life, not simply to defer death, but to point to a new birth, a resurrection which only he can bring. He came back too, you know, back from beyond the grave, three days in his tomb, long enough for decay to take hold, but he appeared to Mary, to Peter, to the apostles, to us all. And we know that even though we die, one day we shall live, even as he lives now. So thank you, Stuart. So even allowing for the author's imagination, it's no doubt safe to say that Lazarus would have been aware that he would die again. And next time there wouldn't be Jesus around to, as it were, awaken him from sleep. This then would be, would need a different kind of resurrection, the kind that Martha believed in when she said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus responded to that, the one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? That new life begins as soon as we believe. A new life that affects what we do, what we say, how we act towards others. Paul writes about that new life in another of the readings set for today. You'll find a reference to it on the uh, notice sheet and in the sermon notes. It's Romans chapter 8. In that reading, Paul contrasts two ways of behaving. You could say two ways of living, except that one way, living without God's spirit, guiding by what Paul calls the sinful nature, ends. But the other way of living, guided by God's Holy Spirit, continues beyond the grave. It does not end. In the reading from Ezekiel, there was that vivid picture of dry bones coming together, then tendons, flesh and skin clothing them. It was not until God's Spirit was breathed in them that they lived. The key is the Holy Spirit living in us, something that marks us out as a Christian and is the guarantee to new life. 
Not only that, but a life here and now, guiding, helping, and empowering us to live a life worth living. It all begins by responding to Jesus like Martha. Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who was to come into the world. When asked by Jesus, who do you say I am? Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. At the end of John's Gospel, he gives the reason for writing that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Later in the service we'll be saying a creed together, a statement of what it is that Christians believe, but at its heart is that Jesus is the Son of God who came into the world. Reciting creeds are not magic words that guarantee that, that new and eternal life, because faith should lead to action. And James writes, faith without deeds is useless. So perhaps we might pause after we recited the creed later on and reflect on how our deeds reflect the faith that we have just professed. I'm going to end with something we shared in our recent life group. It illustrates that for all our words and creeds, an expression of faith can be very simple. It concerns a sermon back in 2019 by Alistair Begg. He began with the image of the crucifixion, the three crosses, Jesus in the middle flanked by two criminals. According to Luke, one hurled insults at Jesus, the other rebuked him and said, we deserve this, but this man has done nothing wrong. He went on to say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I wonder if you can remember what Jesus said in response to that. He said, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. In his sermon, Alistair then imagined the conversation when the criminal reached paradise. And I'll read from his sermon. Angel, what are you doing here? Criminal, I don't know. Angel, uh, excuse me, let me get my supervisor. Angel supervisor. So just a few questions for you. First of all, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? Criminal, I've never heard about it in my life. Angel supervisor. And what about the doctrine of scripture? The criminal just looked bewildered. And eventually in frustration, angel supervisor. On what basis are you here? Criminal. The man on the middle cross said, I can come. Angel supervisor. You've never been to a Bible study. You never got baptised. You didn't know a thing about church membership, and yet, you made it. Criminal. The man on the middle cross said, I can come. You'll find a link to that on the sermon notes, as well as the various Bible references. So let's pray now to that man on the middle cross. Lord Jesus Christ, you came to bring us life in all its fullness, to offer hope beyond the grave. Teach us that death is not the ending, but a new beginning, the gateway to life everlasting. And may that confidence shape not only our attitude towards death, but towards life also. May we live each day, not just in the context of here and now, but of eternity. Know there is nothing in heaven or earth that shall ever finally be able to separate us from your love. Amen. Amen. Our next hymn begins, O Breath of Life, God's Spirit that we each need in our lives. But we also need that Spirit in the church, not our church, but God's church.
not this building, but God's people, guiding, helping, and empowering us in unity to go and make disciples. in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist, we believe and trust in you. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again? We believe and trust in you. Do you believe and trust in God, the Holy Spirit, who gave life to the people of God and makes Christ known to the people of God? We believe and trust in him. This is our faith. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We will now have a quiet moment before we have our notices. Please be seated. Just a quick reminder that um, we've got Rodri Bowen joining us this afternoon to take us through the feedback from the questionnaires and, and to look at some analysis of that. So. Um, hopefully, a lot of you can join us at 2.30 this afternoon. Rodri's just made a slight change to the time scale. He thinks it will go on until 4.15, so 2.30 to 4.15, and then at 4.15 we hope to have 
tea, um, and as I've said before, if you can bring some cakes along. So appreciate that some of you have got other things um, that we've got organised, but it would be lovely to see as many of you as can make it this afternoon at 2.30. Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you very much to everybody who responded to Ready Food to Peel. Last, uh, last Monday I took 15 bags of um, items and uh, napkins and other things and included 30 Easter eggs. So thank you very much for those who responded. We're still picking up Easter eggs today. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> I have here my completed master's thesis that I submitted this week. That this has been uh, in the works since February last year and uh, it was meant to be handed in in September but due to health reasons um, I had it uh, delayed and had a study break, but thank you for all the support and prayers over the past however long it has been appreciated. And it was Paddy's birthday on Thursday, St. Patrick's Day, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's in birthdays and happy days. Birthdays are happy days for loving and sharing. Thank you. And I would like to thank you for being so welcoming to me on the three occasions that I've been here. I will come and visit again, um, but this is the last service that I'm leaving for the time being. So thank you very, very much for your kindness and your welcome. Let us now prepare for our intercession. Reach out and touch the Lord as he passes by. You'll find he's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. He is passing by this moment, your needs to supply. Reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, and is, and is to come. Holy is the Lord. Lord God, we live in a beautiful world, with the wonder of your creation all around us. And yet we see so many places in the world where dangerous climatic changes are taking place. Lord, guide us that we would always seek to care for your creation in every way, in all the decisions we make, in our homes and in the parish here at St Catherine's. Forgive us for the damage we do to your creation and help us always to seek the ways of restoration. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We 
pray today for all those affected by the devastating tornado in Mississippi. We pray that all the help needed will be swiftly provided to those who have lost family, their homes and their livelihoods. And we lift to you today all those suffering in the war-torn areas of this world. For those who do not know where the next meal will come from. For those who long for peace in their lives and communities. We pray that you will bring your peace to those places. Protect all those who are suffering in body, mind or spirit. Whether from years of conflict or years of famine. Lord, in your mercy. Within the parish this week, we pray for all who live in Pelton Way, Holford Close, Swiss Cottage Close, Homecroft, Lammis Way and Mayfield Avenue. Lord, in all those roads, there are people who need healing, who need peace in their bodies, minds and spirits. Touch each one of them, Lord Jesus, with the peace and healing that only you can give. In our church family, we pray for Anthony and Christine Pierce. We pray that you would greatly bless them and their family. We pray today for the work of Nothing Lost, and especially as they host a gathering of young people pray for that gathering, that all the teenagers will make new friends and great memories, and will come away having heard words of wisdom. We pray for all the members of the Mother's Union across the world, and thank you for the loving work they do in so many ways in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. From our prayer book, we pray for June Page, we give thanks for a really good medical result. We pray for Brenda Reese, that she, she will have a good night's sleep, that she will be able to rest and sleep peacefully. We pray for Alfie, receiving troop treatment in Houston, Texas, for CRPS. And we pray for his mother, Hella and all the family. And we pray for Eric Anderson in RBH, breaking your peace and your healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Polly Falcon with us today, and for our lay readers, Mike and Tony, for our church wardens, Caroline and Lynn, we pray that you will bless, guide, and strengthen each of them. We lift to you this afternoon's meeting with Roderick Bowen, looking at the feedback from the questionnaire. And in the discussions, as we look at that feedback, feedback, we pray that we will have much to celebrate as we look to the future of the parish. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God from all eternity, in poverty and weakness you came into our world and beyond the boundaries of time. You promised us a richness and abundance of life beyond our wildest imagining. Give us the grace this day to lift our eyes above the cares and pressures of our daily life. <coughs> And joy and sorrow, need and plenty, may we know your protective and guiding presence now and always. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Now, our, our final hymn, We Shall Go Out With Hope of Resurrection. So, stand if you're after this service. Um, I will join you, but only for a short time because we have our APCM down at St. George's today.
I think the last time I was here, I left you with a thought for the week that we are too blessed to lose trust. But given our sermon today and the thoughts of today, I'd like to leave you with another thought. Grief is love with nowhere to go. Grief is love with nowhere to go. It fills your heart that love for your loved ones and when they are no longer there to receive it, it burns within you. And that's why we cry to cool that burning inside us. So remember, grief is love with nowhere to go. Amen. All our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. All our hopes we set on the risen Christ. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. There will be communion in a short while. In the meantime, this, the worship group will do one of my favourites, actually, Waymaker. <laughs> <laughs> Do feel free to join in. <laughs>